Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for these sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe to keep Chapu alive next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Spira's Odd Couple, Waka the Jaka, and Lulu the Gothboo. It's a solid ship dynamic and covers a lot of bases when you need a variety of guardians. Not that Yuna was hurting for guardians, imagine if the Secret Service was made up of two players from the Lakers, Haley Williams, and Tony the Tiger. There are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the- I'll bed We'll start with Waka because he's weirder, so let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need balls. I hope that's the only time I make that joke, but I have very little faith in myself. Speaking of, we need to have more faith than George Michael, aggressively pushing our religion on our squad members even when we're on our way to kill God. Finally, we need some debuffs with methods to make enemies miserable. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Strength will be number one, you're a professional athlete after all. Charisma next, leading a blitzball team requires requires a certain amount of moxie. Dexterity after that, nobody wants to wear heavy armor in a coastal climate like Besaid. Follow that up with Constitution, Blitzball is a full combat sport. It's like rugby, if you could jump kick people without penalty. So it's like rugby. Intelligence is a bit low, you parrot a lot of religion, but I don't know that you totally get it. Actually a good thing, the church ain't all that chill in Spira. We'll dump wisdom though, your insight checks are really bad. Riku is an albed, Yuna is an albed. Are there any other albed I should know about? Meow. Waka is a human, so variant, we're going custom lineage. Custom lineage is variant human, but a little different. You still get a feat, like Tavern Brawler, letting you add one to your strength or constitution scores. We'll go for strength, get proficiency with improvised weapons. Remember, your DM determines the damage of improvised weapons, but I'd say a blitz ball could be a d6 bludgeoning, thrown weapon, but a d4 minimum. They're more like medicine balls than footballs. You also can deal a d4 of damage with an unarmed attack and attempt to grapple after an improvised or unarmed attack as a bonus action. Not totally sure you're going to be grappling, pretty sure that means a whole penalty from the ref, we're here for improvised weapons, and the strength buff, because with custom lineages plus two to a skill of your choice, that will set your strength up to 18 at level one. Now that's what I call a swimmer's bond. Speaking of, grab athletics for your skill of choice, and take the gladiator background for acrobatics and performance skills. You might always lose, but you do also put on a show. We're gonna kick things off as a bard. They get a lot of skills, I want a lot of skills, it works out nicely. Take any three you like. History, persuasion, and religion are all great for a variety of roleplay checks, just maybe don't use them to belittle the culture of another party. Member. For your cantrips, True Strike lets you remind your audience that video games have always been political. Final Fantasy X came out in 2001, and this specific character is used to demonstrate how politicians can use religion to make their followers fear change and scapegoat and other to maintain their political power in perpetuity. It also gives you advantage on a weapon attack next turn. It's bad. We'll get a better version of aim in a bit, just attack twice for now. Message lets you whisper to someone within 120 feet of you. You have to be able to communicate underwater somehow. Sleep puts a creature to sleep, letting you roll 5d8 and put that number of hit points out like a light. Do not throw a basket ball out of light, just flip the switch. Long Strider lets you boost a creature's movement speed by 10 feet. That's all movement speeds, not just striding, so you'll swim faster too. Feather Fall lets you reduce falling damage for up to five falling creatures as a reaction, so your wife, your new star player, the cat dude, the drunk dude, and the girl who can summon gods can cowabunga off the airship if they need to. Heroism makes a creature immune to frightening, and they get your charisma modifier and temporary HP at the start of their turns. Think of it as an inspiring speech, but for a literal piece of inspiration, use Bardic Inspiration to give your allies a d6 to ability checks, saving throws, or attack rolls, and a of times per long rest equal to your charisma modifier. Shooting in Blitzball has either got to be an attack roll or an ability check. I won't tell your DM how to run a special game in their setting made just for your character, but definitely thank your DM for making a special game in their setting just for your character. Second level bards get Jack of All Trades, letting you add half your proficiency bonus to skills you're not proficient with. You're as well-rounded as the water spheres you play in. You also get a Song of Rest, letting your allies recover an extra d6 of healing on short rests for a jock. I think that means slapping your friend's butt and complimenting their hustle. You also can grab another spell. I I don't really need any first level jams yet, but technically you can go to any point in the sphere grid. So healing word, 1d4 plus your charisma modifier as a bonus action to a creature within 60 feet of you. I'm mostly going to be sticking to Waka's section of the grid, but if we're going to make an exception, some rapid healing is always nice. Third level bards get expertise into skills, doubling your proficiency bonus for them. I think athletics and acrobatics will help you with your breakaways. You can also choose a bardic college and you get a full ride athletic scholarship to the College of Lore, letting you drop lots of world info on your protagonist when they Encino Man 
man into the world. You get three extra skills of your choice. Sleight of hand, perception, and nature would be great at parties or funerals, mass funerals. Lots of mass funerals, kind of a bummer of a game. You also get cunning words, letting you use your inspiration die as a reaction to taunt an enemy, subtracting it from an ability check, attack roll, or a damage roll. I'd call that getting a hand on the ball. To block the shot, get your minds out of the gutter. For this level spell, Blindness Deafness lets you put a creature in the dark, forcing a constitution saving throw on them and blinding them for a minute if they fail, or deafening them, though that's not in character. Fourth level bards get an ability score improvement. Let's start working on charisma first. It will make your extra effects harder to resist and help your inspiration by giving you more. For this level spell, Silence creates a 20 foot radius sphere of silence that prevents any sound. That means verbal components of spells, so if you're dealing with a caster, this will deal with them faster. Bars. Fifth level bards get a font of inspiration, so your inspiration will recharge on short rests instead of a long rest, which should help you be better when you have a double header. Hey, bars again, and it even bumps up to a d8 for better encouragement and hardier butt slaps. You can also learn third level spells. Zombie attack is technically on Auron's section of the sphere grid, but it's an attack attack, so I think it should be for Waka. Auron's got the break attacks. Anyway, the stow curse is how we're going to do that. Letting you force a wisdom saving throw on a creature, cursing them if they fail to do something. You can pick an ability score to give a creature disadvantage on skill checks or saving throws on that score. You can give them disadvantage on attacks against you. You can force them to make a wisdom saving throw or do nothing on their turns or can deal an extra d8 of damage. You can also choose a different option, but your DM has to agree to it. I think healing hurts would be decent. There's a chance it does nothing. The most busted thing you could do with it is dropping a ninth level slot on mass heal to do 700 damage to a creature, but that's more coming from the ninth level slot, you know? Like you could just cast Meteor Swarm or Power Word Kill to kill someone. If your DM isn't cool with that, just take that extra necrotic damage. Six level lore bards get additional magical secrets, letting you scoop up two spells from any list. Water breathing gives 10 creatures the ability to breathe underwater for 24 hours. You only get eight people on the field at any time, so that's two alternates as well. You can also get overdrive thanks to Elemental Weapon, letting you make a weapon magical, adding plus one to your attack rolls with the weapon, and adding a d4 of acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage to that weapon. There isn't any water damage in D&D, but thunder could be a decent way to simulate the crashing of waves. To be truly accurate, you should roll a d5 to determine what type of damage you do. We'll jump over to fighter now. We don't quite have all the ball powers yet, but I want you to get better at yeeting. Fighters get a fighting style like thrown weapon fighting to add two to the damage of thrown weapon attacks, almost making them as good as bows. Not really. Bows can use sharpshooter since they're ranged weapons and thrown weapons aren't ranged weapons. They can just make ranged weapon attacks. 5e has some fun wording to rules. You also get second wind, letting you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest. Cool off with a bit of brondo and get back in there. Second level fighters get action surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest so you could sleep and attack or blind and attack. It's great for getting a spell and a yeet off in the same round. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype. I was thinking about Eldritch Knight for weapon bond to bring the ball back for an automatic rebound, but you know what? You get nothing by spending your bonus action to bring your ball back. Elemental weapon would be terrible on a thrown weapon without that since you're spending a third level slot on a d4 of extra elemental damage and then throwing that weapon away. But technically, Waka's overdrive only goes on to one attempt. So yeah, it's not great. But that makes Battlemaster a little more in character. Giving you four superiority die per short rest you can spend on three maneuvers. Quick Toss lets you make a thrown weapon attack as a bonus action and add a superiority die to the damage. It's already dealing more than elemental weapon. I guess that's a good thing. Commander Strike lets you tell an ally to make an attack as a bonus action using their reaction and they can add a superiority die to the damage. A great coach knows that their players are the true path to victory. Finally, Rally lets you give a creature your superiority die plus your charisma modifier and temporary HP for the hardiest of butt slaps. Fourth level fighters get an ability score improvement. We'll keep pushing that charisma modifier up. Strength will also help with damage, but the guy throwing soccer balls at people was never going to be in charge of DPS. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action. If you're effectively calling the blitz ball a light hammer, just carry a bunch of them. Pick them up. When you're done fighting, maybe ask Riku to build you a returning weapon. You get two. You two get along pretty great. I'm sure nothing will ever happen to jeopardize that friendship. Sixth level fighters get another ability score improvement. Cap off your charisma modifier to put your wacky effects on even the toughest of monsters. Now we're going to bounce back to Bard for seventh level spells like freedom of movement, stopping anything from slowing your movement speed like difficult terrain, paralyzation, or restraint. You can even break out of non-magical shackles with five feet of movement, useful to get out of grapples in the game, or when the church locks you up for working on a heretical quest to expose how they exploit disasters and suffering to endlessly expand their reign. Eighth level bards get another ability score improvement, so you can cap off your strength modifier for maximum ball bashing. For this level spell, we'll jump back to the second level for enhanced ability, letting you give a creature advantage on ability checks of a certain type. Strength will double their carrying capacity. Dexterity makes them immune to falling damage from heights of 20 feet or less, and constitution gives them 2d6 temporary HP. Strength would be useful if you want football Captain America to literally put the team on his back. Whatever you choose, it'll last for an hour, depending on your concentration. Ninth level bards get fifth level spells. Skill empowerment gives a creature expertise in a skill they're already proficient with. It'll last for an hour, depending on your concentration. It's 
sort of like enhance ability but a little more consistent and will let you have expertise on five skills at the same time that is after you hit the 10th level of bard for expertise in two more skills like persuasion and religion use that athlete platform to convert the non-believers if you've ever watched the wrap-up commentary of a professional sporting event you know god really cares about who wins the sports ball games and apparently hates the losing team you also get two more magical secrets plus gives up to three creatures a t4 to add to attack rolls and saving throws for up to a minute depending on your concentration should help everyone aim a little bit better since the party can only have three active members at a time enervation lets you drain your enemy forcing a dexterity saving throw on a creature dealing 2d8 necrotic damage if they succeed if they fail they take 4d8 necrotic damage and you can keep dealing 4d8 necrotic damage to them every round for a minute depending on your concentration you also get to heal the necrotic damage you deal it's so weird that waka gets drained i don't fully get it who looked at the jock man and was like yeah give him a vampire beam that seems about right your bardic inspiration die also pumps up to a d10 here that's all we need from bard so we're going to finish this off with fighter levels seventh level battle masters get to know their enemy letting you know a creature's strength dexterity constitution hp ac fighter levels or total levels you get two pieces of information for each minute of scouting it lets you know if you're better worse or equal to them in that regard gotta know how you stack up to the other teams probably bad the aurochs are bad you also get another superiority die to spend on two more maneuvers commanding presence lets you add your superiority die to a persuasion performance or intimidation check and tactical assessment lets you add it to a history insight or investigation check basically you've got your own personal inspiration die before you inspire the team you gotta inspire yourself eight level fighters get another ability score improvement or feat we're gonna go with inspiring leader letting you give up to six creatures temporary hp equal to your charisma modifier plus your total level after a rousing 10 minute speech full eyes clear hearts can't lose that's all you gotta say ninth level fighters get indomitable letting you re-roll a failed saving throw once per long rest walk as evasion isn't the best but he dodges every once in a while our capstone is the 10th level of battle master for improved combat superiority bumping your superiority die to a d10 and you get two final maneuvers precision attack lets you add the superiority die to the attack roll instead making sure you absolutely hit when you need to distracting strike gives your next ally to attack a creature advantage on the roll and you add your superiority die as well so it's more damage on your turn and even more damage on Orin's turn now that we've hit level 20 let's figure out how viable this build is first you're a great coach with inspiration die buffing spells and maneuvers to make your team better you're also loaded with skills and have expertise in four of those with skill empowerment and maneuvers to jack some of those up even higher finally you should be dealing some consistent damage with a plus seven damage modifier extra attack and superiority die to put some extra oomph on your hits but if you're spending your superiority die on damage team buffs and skill checks you're gonna burn through them pretty fast you're also pretty fragile with bad ac and hp somewhere in the 120 range depending on how you roll finally throwing weapons are bad they're miserable to buff with elemental weapon we took tavern brawler to use a soccer ball in raw that's a bad feat and there are just so many ways this could be better if you just didn't want to hit things with sporting equipment but maybe you don't want to be good maybe you want to hit people with sporting equipment rally the team debuff the enemies and apparently use some borderline necromancy that's honestly probably just to get goth girls to like you hey speaking of that Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need some black magic. That's elemental magic with big heckin' blasts of fire, lightning, frost, and water. We'll have to reflavor water. There isn't water damage in D&D. Next, we need to unleash the fury, spamming multiple spells in the same round for maximum magical damage. Finally, we'll get a doll that kicks people. It won't deal a lot of damage, but it will be cute. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want. Just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Obviously, we need barbarian levels. Charisma will be number one. You've got a huge personality that makes you a popular squad member dexterity next evasion is one of your better stats somehow the goth girl is better at dodging hits than her professional athlete boyfriend constitution after that sometimes you need to focus that's literally one of your abilities follow that up with intelligence obviously you've got to know arcana if you're your party's main magical dps wisdom is a bit low we don't really need it but we'll dump strength i think the implication of sending a stuffed animal to punch someone is that you don't punch as hard as the stuffed animal lulu is a human we'll actually use human because it works a little bit better for her than and custom lineage you get a feat the meta magic adept feat will give you two sorcery points you can spend on meta magic options like distant spell to double the spells range or empowered spell to re-roll a number of damage die on spells equal to your charisma modifier it gets more important at later levels when you've got tons of charisma to make lots of die for your enemies bump your charisma and constitution with your two free points odd numbers don't do anything for you so this is why we didn't go custom lineage like we did with waka his feat let him round one up to 18. grab acrobatics for your skill of choice to be better at dodging and the haunted one background for 
Archon and Religion. I think everyone in Spira could grab this after a Sin attacks, but they hit your little family group extra hard. We'll kick things off as a Sorcerer to get the most out of our spells right away. First, you get two skills from the Sorcerer Lusk, like Intimidation and Insight. I'm not super sold on Insight, but she's a solid shoulder for people to pry on, even if she can be a bit rough on them. It's all love. Shadow Sorcerers are the edgiest, so that fits your nine belts and fur coat aesthetic, giving you Eyes of Dark for 120 feet of dark vision. You could see perfectly fine in the belly of a whale, but that's a weirdly specific scenario. I can't imagine it happening to you. You also get Strength of the Grave, letting you roll a Charisma saving throw when you should hit zero HP of five plus the damage taken. Hopefully damage works a little differently in D&D than in Final Fantasy, where at level one, attacks are dealing over 100 damage. For your cantrips, Firebolt is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d10 fire damage. Ray of Frost is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d8 cold damage and slows a creature down by 10 feet. And Shocking Grasp is a melee spell attack that deals 1d8 lightning damage and prevents reactions. Lulu doesn't get up close when she casts, but there's actually a way around this a little later in the build. Thunderclap will be our water spell, forcing a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot radius of you, dealing a d6 of thunder damage to those that fail. I think concussive force would be pretty similar to a wave, it's just a sound wave instead. For your first level spells, Ice Knife is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d10 piercing damage and forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures within 5 feet of the first creature, dealing 2d6 cold damage to those that fail. If you want your blizzard to be more like an exploding icicle, up to you. Burning Hands forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot cube, dealing 3d6 fire damage to those that fail, have as much to those that succeed, a little area of effect is never bad. Second level sorcerers get a font of magic, which you kind of already had, but now you have two more sorcery points you can use to recover spell slots or augment your spells with those meta magic options. You basically just start casting in the accelerated program, which means you'll eventually be outclassed by other people and feel empty and meaningless since the praise in your youth inflated your sense of self-worth to the point of inevitable collapse. Anyway, Witch Bolt is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d12 lightning damage and stays latched on for the next minute depending on your concentration, letting you automatically reroll the damage die every round. Third level sorcerers get meta magic, or in your case, more meta magic. Quicken spell lets you cast a spell as a bonus action that normally takes an action, so you can launch two firebolts, shocking grasps, thunderclaps, or rays of frost for some serious fury. Twin spell lets you make a spell that normally hits one creature, hit two instead, so you can basically fire off three of those cantrips in a single round with quicken spell. Overdrive at level three, and it will just get more powerful later. Just don't spin the analog stick with your palm, otherwise you'll end up with the Mario Party stigmata. Scorching Ray will make that even more intense with three fireballs that deal 2d6 fire damage each. You can hit one creature or multiple, so a twin firebolt with your action or a quickened Scorching Ray is up to five targets getting burned at the same time. Spread that love around. Love is code for fire. Fourth level sorcerers get an ability score improvement. Charisma is obviously priority number one. The spells are the top priority for you. For this level spell, Blur will boost your evasion, giving your enemies disadvantage on attack rolls against you. Lulu doesn't tank. She just kindly steps out of the way of attack, then brushes off the dirt. You would think black doesn't show dirt, but it does. What you want is dark blue or gray. Fifth level sorcerers get third level spells. Protection from energy will give a creature resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage for an hour, depending on your concentration. Focus raises the magical damage, but it also raises that magical defense, and Lord knows there are a lot of bombs and flans late game. Six level shadow sorcerers get a hound of ill omen, summoning a shadowy dire wolf that's medium instead of large, with temporary HP equal to half your sorcerer level that hunts down one target and disappears if the target or itself hits zero HP. It costs three sorcery points and is way too good for me to call it a reflavored doll. We'll get something worse for it in a second. Normally we get better things, we're actually going to get something deliberately worse this time. For this level spell, Tidal Wave lets you deal some damage with actual water, conjuring a wave of water that's 30 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 10 feet tall, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures inside, dealing 4d8 bludgeoning damage to those that fail, and knocking them prone, which should help melee fighters get advantage on follow-up attacks, but not Waka, he hasn't earned that yet. 7th level sorcerers get 4th level spells, Ice Storm forces a dexterity saving throw in a 20 foot radius, 40 foot high cylinder of ice, dealing 2d8 bludgeoning damage, and 4d6 cold damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. This will be Blizzara levels, we'll still wait a bit longer before starting the Blizzaga Saga. 8th level sorcerers get another ability score improvement, letting you cap off your charisma modifier for better everything. Like, literally everything you do is tied to it. For this level spell, Fireball is from the 3rd level, but it's pretty good, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20 foot radius, dealing 8d6 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. It's a big ball of fire. I don't really know how to describe it beyond that. We're gonna bounce over to Warlock now, since we're mostly here for mechanical purposes, we'll just make you a Hexblade. That'll give you Hexblade's Curse, which is actually really good for you, letting you pick a creature to deal extra damage to equal to your proficiency bonus. You critically hit them on a 19 or a 20 with your attack rolls. I said that right, attack rolls, not weapon attack rolls, any attack rolls. So if you do a quickened fourth level Scorching Ray plus a twin Firebolt, you can deal 10d6 plus 4d10 plus 24 fire damage in a single round. Two of those d10 hit another creature you don't have your curse on, and you can double critical hit chance on every single attack against one of those creatures. It's really fun. Jazz it up even more with the first level spell Hex, letting you add a d6 of necrotic damage to every attack you make against a creature and giving them disadvantage 
advantage on ability checks of a certain type. Again, that's every attack you make. So each Scorching Ray deals 2d6 fire plus 1d6 necrotic plus your proficiency bonus to one creature. It's fun to put some darkness on your dark magic. Shield lets you add 5 to your AC as a reaction for even better reflexes. You also get cantrips, and the best one in the game is Eldritch Blast, letting you shoot two beams that deal a d10 of force damage each. You know what? Force damage is water damage. This is water now. That's what I'm saying. Poison Spray lets you force a constitution save if you're on a creature, dealing 2d12 poison damage to those that fail. Lots of creatures resist poison in Dungeons and Dragons, but lots of creatures resist bio in Final Fantasy. It's on your list though. Eldritch Blast is going to be way better. Since we're multi-classing spellcasters, don't get stressed out. Warlock plays nicer with other casters, just giving you a few extra slots you wouldn't have if you were only a warlock. They recover on short rests instead of long rests, so you can burn them down into sorcery points to always have a little extra in your pocket. I'm sure your dress has pockets. It has nine belts. I actually looked it up to confirm that. You have no pockets. The bottom half is literally made of belts. Second level warlocks get invocations, special things that will make them better than the other casters. Armor of Shadows lets you cast Mage Armor at will, setting your AC to 13 plus your dexterity modifier. Obviously, Mage Armor just looks like a fur coat made of belts. Agonizing Blast lets you add your Charisma modifier to the damage of your Eldritch Blast attacks, which means plus nine damage modifiers with Hexblade's curse at this point. Water is my favorite of the elements, and it's disrespected so regularly. So this will make your Eldritch Blast a super soaker. For this level spell, I don't know. Expeditious Retreat will let you dash as a bonus action for 10 minutes. I don't really want that many Warlock spells. I'm just here for something much sillier. Third level Warlocks choose a Pact Boon, a gift to make you sillier with Pact of the Chain. That lets you cast Find Familiar to conjure a tiny little animal buddy, a cat, a frog, a weasel, or something like that. Though you could also grab a Pseudo Dragon, Sprite, or Quasit, and yours can attack. Almost all of those damage options deal one damage at most. Woohoo. The best thing to do with it is cast touch range spells like Shocking Grasp or to look through its senses as a scout, but the most in-character option have that little weasel a waddle forward and do a backflip. For this level spell, Shatter forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 10-foot radius, dealing 3d8 thunder damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. This will be another big water blast, but Eldritch Blast is better. It's so much better that I'm not actually going to grab any more Warlock levels. We're just going to jump back to Sorcerer instead for 5th level spells like Cone of Cold, forcing a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 60-foot cone, dealing 8d8 full damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. Hell yes, this is the Blizzaga saga I'm talking about. 10th level Sorcerers get another meta magic option, Heightened Spell lets you give a creature disadvantage on saving throws against a spell you cast, making your Blizzaga harder to avoid or your Bio harder to avoid. Cloud Kill creates a 20-foot radius cloud of stinky gas that forces a constitution saving throw on creatures inside. Failing that, they take 5d8 poison damage, sticks around for up to 10 minutes depending on your concentration, but again, poison damage is pretty hit or miss. Have someone else scan the enemy first before committing to a high-level spell. 11th level Sorcerers get 6-level spells. Chain Lightning forces a dexterity saving throw on a creature within 150 feet of you and 3 creatures within 30 feet of them, dealing 10 d8 lightning damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. Who needs a godlike unicorn when you have the power of being goth? 12 level sorcerers get another ability score improvement. We're going to start working on your dexterity to boost your evasion. No spell at this level, but you get another sorcery point, and let's be honest, you're using those almost as much as your actual spell slots. 13th level sorcerers get 7th level spells. Delayed Blast Fireball creates a bead of fire that doesn't explode just yet, but it could if you wanted it to. In the first round, it forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20 foot radius, dealing 12d6 fire damage to those that fail, with the damage increasing by a d6 every round you delay it for a minute depending on your concentration. Cast it at the start of the fight, spend a few cantrips, and unleash it for some true flare potential. 14th level shadow sorcerers get shadow wall, letting you teleport between areas of dim light within 120 feet of you. It's not something Lulu does in the game, but really, she doesn't need to, right? All the fights happen when people are standing still. Obviously, she still has this power, and I'm not just giving it to her to get abilities that I want later. 15th level sorcerers can learn 8th level spells, incendiary cloud forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20 foot radius, dealing 10d8 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. The cloud rolls forward like cloud kill for a minute depending on your concentration. Why does Lulu have so many fire options in D&D? Because there are just more fire options in D&D. Every fantasy setting loves and coddles fire damage and ignores everything else, so hopefully that means you like fire damage too. 16th level sorcerers get our last ability score improvement, get your dexterity up as high as it can go. Unfortunately, we won't be able to cap it off if we want a 9th level spell, which I do. Our capstone is the 17th level of sorcerer for 9th level spells like power word kill, which instantly kills a creature with 100 HP or less. Death does doesn't work on most bosses, this is probably why. At least in D&D, you can roast people down to size, then use this to finish off the boss early. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, damage. Lots of damage. Hexblade's Curse and Hex with your Rapid Fire Fury casting pair up to do absolutely devastating damage. You also have a ton of damage variety, so no matter what resistances or vulnerabilities creatures have, you'll be hurting them. Finally, Charisma is a very fun skill to be good at, especially when you're a grumpy gal who gets what she wants by scowling. For weaknesses, you're a bit of a unitasker. If you're not blowing people up in combat, you're not all that effective. Your low strength means that you could get shoved around by a kaiju you're fighting. Finally, power word kill might seem like it's great on the surface, but you have no idea how much HP the boss has, so it's a risky way to spend
spend a knife and puzzle slot. Thankfully, you can just upcast Scorching Ray to deal 20d6 fire, 10d6 necrotic damage, plus 60 from Hexblade's Curse. If you want something consistent, then follow it up with four blasts of Eldritch Blast to deal 1d10 force, plus 1d6 necrotic, plus 11 damage each for something even more consistent. Unleash the fury of black magic and enjoy the support of your himbo husband. When it comes to protecting Yuna, you're the one who does the damage. Just watch out for other high-end casters, or you could see more of the far plane than you'd like. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We're doing double videos every day this month. Join the Patreon for this sheet and a whole bunch more. Sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.